Elders and sisters, we welcome you to this worldwide missionary broadcast. There are now approximately 75,000 of you serving in 418 missions around the world. In this hall today, we have approximately one missionary for every mission in the world. We are also joined today by many of the general authorities and the general auxiliary presidencies. We are honored by their presence. On the stand are members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and members of the Missionary Executive Council who supervise missionary work throughout the world. President Russell M. Nelson, the President of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, presides at this meeting. Also seated on the stand is Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve, who serves as the Chairman of the Missionary Executive Council. Elders David A. Bednar, Neil L. Anderson, Gary E. Stevenson, and Dale G. Renland, also of the Quorum of the Twelve. Elder L. Whitney Clayton, the Senior President of the Presidency of the Seventy, Bishop W. Christopher Waddell, Sister Bonnie L. Oscarson, and Brother Stephen B. Allen. I'm Elder Brent H. Nielsen, and it is my pleasure to serve with these great leaders as a member of the Missionary Executive Council in my assignment as the Executive Director of the Missionary Department. In the Conference Center are the Presidents of the Seventy who, directly, who direct the work in your areas. We welcome them and their wives. We are delighted to have missionaries from around the world joining us live. Missionaries in Hawaii are watching right now at 7 a.m. as are missionaries in Helsinki, Finland, where it is 7 p.m. Missionaries serving in Thailand, Tonga, and Tokyo will watch this broadcast when they wake up. <laughs> we welcome you all. We love you. We thank you for your service. We are honored to serve with you. We trust that we are all united in the spirit of fulfilling our missionary purpose. We wish to thank our accompanist, Brother Reed Wagstaff, and our music director, Sister Amanda Ortiz Villa Lona. We will begin our meeting by singing Call to Serve, Hymn 249, after which Carter Sanders will offer the invocation. Following the invocation, we will be taught by Elder Neil L. Anderson. We will then receive instruction from Elder David A. Bednar, who recently met with a group of missionaries from the Utah Ogden Mission. Bishop W. Christopher Waddell will then address us.
our Father in heaven, as we gather together, our hearts are full. We are grateful to be members of the living church of thy son, Jesus Christ, led by a living prophet, President Thomas S. Monson. We are thankful for his servants that he has chosen to speak to us today. Our only desire today is to be better representatives of thy son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that thy spirit will be with us this morning and upon those whom thou hast chosen to speak to us, that the words will sink into our hearts. Father, we love thy son, Jesus Christ, and we feel thy love. And we offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful prayer. Our dear missionaries across the world, I bring you the love of President Thomas S. Monson, the First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve. As we kneel together in the upper room of the temple or alone in our homes, we pray for you. We know you pray for us as well, and we thank you for your prayers. We count you as our friends, our fellow disciples, our companions, as we build the kingdom of God in preparation for the Savior's return to the earth. We have not held a devotional like this with all the missionaries around the world in more than a decade. We have felt the Lord's Spirit directing us in how to help you in your righteous efforts to invite all to come unto Christ. We have titled our devotional today, Teach Repentance and Baptize Converts. I promise you, as you prayerfully open your minds and hearts during the next two hours, you will receive the spiritual direction you have desired and your mission will be blessed. We in the Quorum of the Twelve share a sacred charge with you. The most important thing we do and the most important thing you do is testify of the Savior and invite all to come unto him. No one testified of the Savior with greater power than Elder Richard G. Scott, a fellow member of the Twelve who passed away last September. Once, while I was with him in the city of Vitoria, Brazil, he told me of an important lesson he learned in a previous visit to that beautiful city. After an evening devotional, while shaking hands with the saints, an elderly sister handed him a note that he read later that night. The note said, Dear Elder Scott, I very much enjoyed your talk tonight, but I traveled many hours to learn more about the Savior and to hear your witness of him. Elder Scott realized that he had not spoken of, he had spoken of many important subjects, but that he had neglected his powerful witness of the Savior. He told me, that day I committed to the Lord to always have his name on my lips and to be prepared to testify of him at all times and in all places. As a missionary, always keep his name on your lips and be prepared as the prompting comes to testify of him. I know you talk to everyone who will listen to you. Wherever you are, in a bus, on the street, in a teaching situation, or in a home of a member, if you are ever unsure of what to say, speak of the Savior, testify of him, speak of his doctrine, of faith in him, of his atonement, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. This is your purpose. This is your charge. This is what we do, you as missionaries and we as the Quorum of the Twelve. Because of the restoration, you and I know more about the Savior than anyone else. Our greatest responsibility is to extol and defend the divine mission and doctrine of our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. No matter how much we speak of him, 
it is never too much. No matter how much we love him, our adoration is just beginning. We remember him, and he remembers us. Here is one of my very favorite promises from the Savior. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Amazing. I give you my witness that the Savior lives and that he knows you and loves you. We testify of Christ as we teach the doctrine of Christ. That doctrine is summarized in words that you all know very, very well. Our purpose is to invite others to come unto Christ by helping them receive the restored gospel through faith in Jesus Christ and his atonement, repentance, baptism, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. This doctrine is explained in simplicity in 2 Nephi 31, 3 Nephi 11, 3 Nephi 27, and throughout the scriptures. It's not complicated, and we must not make it complicated. In presenting the doctrine of Christ, Nephi says that he will speak plainly or simply because he says, after this manner doth the Lord God work among the children of men, giving light unto their understanding. We are commanded to keep our teaching simple. I realize I speak to missionaries in very different situations. Some are in countries and cultures that hardly know the name of Jesus Christ, while some of you are in cultures and countries where the name of Jesus Christ is honored and respected. As a missionary and as a general authority, I've lived eight years of my life in Europe, four years of my life in South America, and many years in the United States. We travel extensively. Next month, my wife Kathy and I will see some of you in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Zambia, and Mozambique three wonderful countries of Africa. Because people throughout the world differ in their readiness, their sophistication, and their receptivity, we carefully craft and adapt our message to the, of the doctrine of Christ to their specific needs. Some you teach will be like those on Mars Hill, where the Apostle Paul said that he found an altar with the inscription, to the unknown God. He then introduced the doctrine of Christ by saying, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. He started at the beginning, teaching them about faith in the true God, that we are the offspring of God and that Jesus Christ was sent by his Father. Alma once had a group of very poor people approach him and ask, we have no place to worship our God. And behold, what shall we do? Alma began teaching the doctrine of Christ by telling them they were blessed because they were humble. And if they would repent, they would find mercy and eventually be saved. After an amazing spiritual manifestation on the day of Pentecost, following the resurrection of Christ, the people were pricked in their hearts or they felt a powerful spiritual impression and asked Peter and the other apostles, what shall we do? Recognizing their faith, Peter taught them the doctrine of Christ in its purest form. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Just like Paul, Alma, and Peter, you find people with varying degrees of faith and spiritual understanding. As you assess their faith and their needs, teach and testify of the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine clearly stated in your missionary purpose. The Savior prayed, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. 
we help the sons and daughters of God, our brothers and sisters, to come to know God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and to feel their love more completely. Your first responsibility is to help lift the faith of a man, woman, or child from wherever they are to a greater faith in Jesus Christ and His Atonement. I love the statement in Preach My Gospel, as your understanding of the Atonement of Jesus Christ grows, your desire to share the Gospel will increase. Ask yourself, what do I really believe about the Savior's Atonement? Am I personally experiencing every day the Atonement? By increasing your own understanding of the Atonement, your effectiveness as a missionary will increase. Do you see why this is so important? One of the best ways to invite others to come unto Christ and have faith in Him and in His Atonement is to introduce them gently but powerfully to the scriptural teachings of the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon begins with Nephi's vision of the Savior. From Nephi to Moroni, the beautiful explanations and illustrations of the power of the Savior's Atonement continue. The words of Lehi, Jacob, and Enos, the great teachings of King Benjamin, the testimony of Abinadi, and the miraculous conversions that follow those who experience the Atonement, the teachings of Alma on forgiveness, and Amulek on accountability, of Nephi and the son of Nephi as the Savior is born and later visits the saints in the new world, and the teachings of Mormon and Moroni on the miracles and saving grace of Jesus Christ. Learn to love this powerful spiritual nourishment from the Book of Mormon so that you can share it upon the silver platter of your own faith. As you do, I promise you that you will see the faith of those you teach grow. They will receive as an additional spiritual gift the confirming witness that His gospel is restored upon the earth, for they will know that the Book of Mormon is true. I now turn to the important principle of repentance. Preach My Gospel states, you are called to represent Jesus Christ in helping people become clean from their sins, to come to the Savior, a son or daughter of God, must have faith in Him unto repentance. Now a caution to you. In inviting others to come unto Christ, be careful not to move too quickly from your powerful witness of faith to the challenge of baptism without sufficient emphasis on the teaching each investigator about the critically important principle of repentance. We teach repentance and we baptize converts. The Savior said that many would repent through your words. Our words can help those we teach truly desire to change and repent. Repentance means to change, to return to God, to think more of Him, trust Him and obey His commandments. Of course, it involves the word of wisdom, going to church and reading the scriptures. But repentance means a change of attitude, a beginning of a mighty change of heart. One of the very significant challenges of our day is that many people you teach do not understand why it is necessary to repent and do not know how to repent. You must guide them. Repentance is critical to true conversion. Do you see why? Faith in Jesus Christ brings a desire to turn away from sin. As a man or woman begins to change, the burden of sin is lightened. As they continue, the power of the Atonement of Jesus Christ will eventually eliminate all the guilt and pain and replace these feelings with peace and confidence. This is not some psychological discovery, but the heavenly power of our Savior, who suffered in Gethsemane 
and shed his blood that we might be made clean from our sins. Elders and sisters, your testimony, your teaching, becomes a conduit through which a person begins to act, as Nephi says, without hypocrisy and without deception before God. Through your words, a person begins the real intent necessary for one seeking to come unto Christ. I remember 25 years ago, as Elder Oaks, already a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, visited the mission where I presided. The photo you see is of that day, as he spoke at a pulpit in Bordeaux, France, speaking to the missionaries. Looks just the same, doesn't he? <laughs> One of the subjects he talked about was the meaning of the term real intent. Nephi speaks of real intent, as does Moroni. Elder Oaks explained to our missionaries that real intent meant that the person praying was saying to the Lord something like this, I do not ask out of curiosity, but with total sincerity to act on the answer to my prayer. If thou wilt give me this answer, I will act to change my life. I will respond. I will join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I will become a disciple of thy son. Unless we help those we teach to get on their knees and learn how to pray personally with real intent, even when we are not with them, they may never feel the need to change or the effect of this repentance. Kneel down with those you teach. We teach repentance and we baptize converts. Next in our purpose is baptism. Do not ever be afraid to teach baptism as you speak of faith and repentance. Of course, there are some areas of the world where baptisms are more frequent than in other areas of the world. But don't be afraid to challenge yourself and engage your investigators to baptism, no matter where you serve. Talk about baptism. Set goals that point to baptism. Be open with your mission president and your mission leaders about who you are teaching and their preparations for baptism. If you are not having success, ask for help from others who are baptizing. If you have few who are progressing, don't feel sorry for yourself. Find others to teach. <clears throat> <clears throat> Nephi makes it clear that when one has faith in Christ and repents, the next step is baptism. Ordinances are essential to salvation and bring us closer to God. My beloved elders and sisters, I share one final truth. The doctrine of Christ can only be received through revelation. Nephi warns, if we can't, if ye cannot understand what I have said, it will be because ye ask not, neither do ye knock. Wherefore, ye are not brought into the light, but must perish in the dark. But then he adds, if ye will enter in by the way and receive the Holy Ghost, it will show unto you all things what ye should do. I finish with two verses that beautifully connect your missionary purpose and the doctrine of Christ. The first fruits of repentance is baptism. And baptism cometh by faith unto fulfilling the commandments. And the fulfilling the commandments bringeth remission of sins. And the remission of sins bringeth meekness and lowliness of heart. And because of meekness, and lowliness of heart cometh the visitation of the Holy Ghost, which comforter filleth with hope and perfect love, which love endureth by diligence unto prayer until the end shall come when all the saints shall dwell with God. There it is. Our purpose 
and the doctrine of Christ in two verses. We teach repentance and baptize converts. We invite others to come unto Christ by helping them receive the restored gospel through faith in Jesus Christ and his atonement, repentance, baptism, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. I humbly share with you my sure witness that Jesus is the Christ. He is resurrected. He appeared with his father to the prophet Joseph Smith. He directs his kingdom upon the earth today through his prophet Thomas S. Monson. Speak of him. Speak of his doctrine. He will speak of you to the Father. And if we continue faithful one day, we will all be wrapped in his arms with those we love, and we will be his forever. We love you, but more importantly, he loves you. I bless you that you might feel his love as you righteously teach his doctrine. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Elders and sisters, we are going to address a very important topic today, the role of the Holy Ghost in conversion. Let's begin by just asking, what are the first things that come to your mind and your heart as you hear that topic? the role of the Holy Ghost in conversion. Elder, please. When I think about the role of the Holy Ghost in conversion, I think about how important it is to be the vessel for the Lord, for us to bring it under the hearts of the people. How important it is to be the type of missionary to teach the people, to be the vessel that the Lord can trust. Good. Now, let me use just a, a slight phrase that you used so that you can bring it into the hearts of the, the investigators and the people. Now, don't answer this question, but can you take it into the hearts of the people? And the answer is no. You can bring it unto the heart, but you can't push it into the heart. That's a very, very important thing to understand. There are lots of missionaries who think, if I have enough faith, if my testimony is powerful enough, I can just jam it right into the heart of an investigator. And no, you can't. If it were true that we take the message into the heart of the investigator, then every person with whom the president of this church talks about the restored gospel of Jesus Christ would fall to his or her knees and say, baptize me now. (laughs) And that doesn't happen. So we don't control that outcome. Am I making sense? We have the responsibility to be worthy vessels, exactly as you said so that we can deliver the message and the power of the Spirit this far. The investigator has to invite it into the heart. We'll talk about that in a little bit. That's a great way to begin. Others, please. It makes me think of the scripture that I like in 2 Nephi 33, where it says, And now I, Nephi, cannot write all things which are taught among my people, neither am I mighty in writing like unto speaking. For when a man speaketh by the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it unto the hearts of the children of men. And I like that scripture because it's true. I've seen it in my ministry, and I've seen it with personal friends. Good. Excellent. Anyone else? What comes to your mind? Elder? I guess it would go along with what Elder Hickamot was saying, because when, we, when we're worthy of uh, having the Holy Ghost, we're giving our investigator the best opportunity for it to be carried on to their heart, for them to accept it. May I ask you another question? Sure. Why do you think that's so important? It's probably the only way that they're going to accept the restored gospel. Your investigators can feel the influence of the Holy Ghost. They are not yet in a position to have the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. You as baptized members, as set apart servants of the Lord, are entitled to the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, as you are clean and worthy and valiant in doing your work, then you bring that spirit with you into the teaching setting. You've, sat, you've had the experience of people understanding clearly and simply the things that you teach, and when you leave, they become somewhat confused. That's because the Holy Ghost is not there in such rich abundance as it was when you were. Therefore, missionaries need to be obedient and worthy because it is the Holy Ghost that you help bring into that teaching venue and setting that is so powerful. The Holy Ghost is the teacher. It's not me. It's not you. In what we're doing right now, 
you'll never learn anything from what I say. And your investigators ultimately will never learn what matters most from you. It will be from the teacher, the third member of the Godhead, who has that responsibility to testify, to teach, to comfort, and to purify. That's the role of the Holy Ghost as the third member of the Godhead. Great observation, thank you. Elder. With that being said, he being the teacher, being the testifier, it's very important to call it out, to let the investigator know this is what you're feeling. Many a times in situations where we have been, they feel it, they nod their heads, they're, they're in the lesson, they don't know what it is though. Part of our role as missionaries is to make sure the focus is not on us, but we help them understand the Holy Ghost is the one bringing it into their hearts. They have to open their hearts to allow it in. We can bring it unto, but the investigator has to invite it into. What else has come to your mind? Elder? When the Holy Ghost enters into their heart, that's the great motivator. That's what motivates them to keep their commitments, to read the Book of Mormon, to come to church. And so, like Elder Garcia said, it's super important um, that we point it out to them because it will teach them all things. Okay, let me ask you a question. Is it important for you to point it out to them or is it for you to help them identify for themselves? It's to help them recognize it. That's right. We have to be careful that we're not so prescriptive that we don't leave them the spiritual latitude to identify it for themselves. So for example, if you have an investigator who has read the Book of Mormon for the first time, you may ask a very simple question. What was it like for you reading the Book of Mormon for the first time? An investigator may say, there's a lot of this Bible kind of language I don't really understand. But it seemed clear and it made sense to me. That's the person's first testimony about the Book of Mormon. It's very small but it's the beginning. And that investigator making those statements, acting as an agent, invites the Holy Ghost to confirm the truthfulness of what that man or woman said. That's how they will come to know, not because you told them, but because that experience is confirmed by the power of the Holy Ghost. And our job is to help them act and have those experiences because as they act in faith, then comes the power of the Holy Ghost. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is a principle of action and of power. That sequence is vital. We act in accordance with the teachings of Christ. Then the Holy Ghost, who is the testator, can confirm the truthfulness of what has been heard or what has been done. So our job is to help them get the initial information about the gospel, the basic knowledge. But everything that we do is intended to then invite them to act for themselves so that the confirming witness of the Holy Ghost goes into their heart, invited through their own exercise of faith. They're acting in accordance with the teachings of Christ, which invites the power of the Holy Ghost. Is this making sense? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So there's, a, there's an interesting paradox. We have a role to play. We have been called. We have been set apart. We are to be there. We are to open our mouths. And in the midst of doing that, we have to make sure we don't get in the way because the Holy Ghost is the teacher. We become that conduit, that vessel, as you mentioned, through whom that power of the Holy Ghost can bless and touch these investigators who have sincere hearts and real intent. Okay, Elder? I, I, I was thinking about the first time I read the Book of Mormon and what you said. The first time I read the Book of Mormon, I had no idea what it was saying, nothing. The only thing that I, that I remember from that first experience was the way I felt. And it wasn't until later that I was taught and I learned about the gospel that I realized what I was feeling was the spirit. So what you're talking about us not just helping them, not just pointing it out, 
but identifying and helping them realize what helping they're Helping them identify what's taking place in their life. That's yes. right. Which is a delicate balance. See, it's, it's quite easy for us to say, well, you're feeling the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. But if we can help draw that out of them, their attempt to explain what's happening to them helps them understand what's happening to them. And that's better than us just telling them what's happening. Mm -hmm. In every instance, our responsibility is to invite and entice the Holy Ghost to influence these people. And the people will be influenced as we invite them to act in accordance with the teachings of the Savior. Okay? Now, the Holy Ghost is the member of the Godhead who delivers the messages from the Father and the Son. So he is the comforter, the testator, the teacher. If conversion comes by the power of the Holy Ghost, what are the things that we do to assist in that process? Elder? Being worthy to have the Spirit with us. Now, we say that so often it can almost be trite. Let's dig down a little bit, okay? Can I just push on you a little? Of course. Why? Why is that so vital? Well, I think Elder Holland said it really well in one of his talks, um, which is that we can't convert someone else if we're unworthy. The words will choke in our throat. And in order, like you said, we're not the teachers, it's the Holy Ghost. And so we're not giving this investigator um, the perfect opportunity, which was said before, to actually accept this gospel if we're not providing a setting where the Spirit can actually be there. Good. Very good. Other thoughts? Elder? And just kind of off of being worthy, we have to be, uh, it comes with being exactly obedient. Exactly, you know, striving to be exactly obedient is because um, when, we're, when we're not, yeah, the Spirit's not with us. And when it's not with us, then we're just saying words. And I've heard the phrase, they'll remember what they felt more than what they, what they heard. Our lack of obedience becomes a barrier to the influence of the Holy Ghost coming into a teaching setting and potentially entering into the hearts of those people. We can stand in the way of that occurring. Okay. Please, Elder. One thing that may be a common belief or whatever, but sometimes missionaries feeling like they can do it themselves, not really allowing the Holy Ghost to fully be there. And so they go off onto like a routine of teaching people instead of following the Spirit during the lesson. So they have some memorized stuff. Mm -hmm. They just kind of go through the motions. Uh, let me see if this example relates to what you've just said. Two missionaries are teaching. They're alternating in the principles that they're presenting. And while one elder or sister is teaching, the other one is checked out thinking about, well, I got this letter from home, I need to take care of this task or something else, right? You're all smiling. We've all done that. <laughs> <laughs> we would never say that, but I want you to consider this. Teaching is not talking. Teaching is listening and observing. It's ears to hear, eyes to see. Then you can discern. Only when you discern can you know what to say. Who's in the best position to observe and listen when a, a lesson is being presented? It's the missionary who's not talking. The missionary who is talking should be listening and observing, but the other one ought to just be dialed in because the missionary who is not talking may sense a reservation, and the answer to the reservation will never be accepted from you. If you're teaching a couple, you may then receive the inspiration to ask a question. And in giving the answer, one of the spouses is teaching the other spouse. Because they will accept it from the spouse. Who's most likely to be in the position to receive that inspiration? The one who's not talking. So it requires really intense spiritual focus all the time. This is hard work. So you don't have the luxury of taking a few minutes off in the middle of a discussion when your companion is doing the talking and you're kind of drifting someplace else. Please. 
I'm in my third transfer, and I'm in Spanish, which is not my first language. And that happens a lot, actually, especially with my trainer. I would just be sitting there trying to keep up with the Spanish when I suddenly felt like I needed to ask one thing. And there was this couple that was baptized back in September, and he would answer most of her questions. We didn't have to do the work. And I was like, this is awesome. The fact that he gets to do this, he's growing, and she's growing, and now we're working towards getting the temple for them. Good. Now, the truth of the matter is, and I hope I don't offend everybody by saying this, none of us are smart enough to know when to ask the right questions. <laughs> we don't even know the questions to ask. But if we're doing our very best, then our utterances will be guided and inspired, and things that don't seem to even fit into the pattern of where we might be going. We've all had that experience. It's not always that way. But if we are so rigid and scripted that we never let it be that way, we are relying totally on the arm of the flesh and not allowing the Holy Ghost to be the teacher. We're getting in the way of the Holy Ghost in this work of conversion. Okay, Elder. I think our testimony plays a huge part in about everything we do, in inviting the Spirit. I remember when I was being taught as a convert, and they taught the lesson and I understood some part of it. But it wasn't until they shared on board that testimony mm -hmm. that I understood the whole part of the lesson. The Holy Ghost has found to me that what they're saying was true. And with that, I was, being, I was able to see things or see the lesson in a different way than I first saw it. Good. So the spirit that was introduced through the bearing of testimony was a vital part of your learning and your conversion. Am I getting that right? Right. Good. All right. Now, let's summarize a couple of things. The Holy Ghost is the teacher. We are not. But we have a very important role to play. That role is to be worthy conduits through whom the Holy Ghost can come to that teaching setting. And hopefully the investigators will invite it into their lives. One of the things that we do to assist investigators is invite them to prepare to learn. Now, if you do something in advance, what is faith in the Savior? It's a principle of action and of power. So as we invite investigators to act, many times their preparation is more important than what happens when we're interacting with them because they are being guided and taught in a powerful way. That preparation for a lesson then leads to interaction that edifies. The Holy Ghost is the source of edification in the lives of these people. And our worthiness helps us in that teaching setting so that the Holy Ghost is there to influence and bless these people as they are asking, seeking, and knocking. Comments about what's just said? Please. I'm just thinking about how we can, we need to change like our mindset and not looking at the Holy Ghost as like a tool that we can use in conversion and sincerely pray to our Holy Father and say, we are the tools right now and you are the teacher and change that so we can be like, if we are blank in a lesson or something, let's just him be the guide and that's how can we like bring the spirit and we can be truly the vessels that just carry the message that he has. So does that mean all the stuff that's emphasized about, well, you got to prepare and have these lesson plans ready to go. You just don't need that. Let the Holy Ghost do it, right? No. <laughs> no. This takes much more intense preparation. Mm -hmm. See, all of the planning, all of the anticipating the needs of the investigator, all of the things that we do set the stage for the Holy Ghost to use us. See, your comment about we become the tools, instead of the Holy Ghost is the tool, the, tool, the Holy Ghost is in charge here, mm -hmm. if we're doing this right. And as we prepare, He will bring all things to our remembrance. He will give us utterance. And in ways we could never anticipate, in the moment, by the power of the Holy Ghost, we will say the things that are most needful for a particular investigator. Do you have to know that's happening for it to be valid? Missionaries get, oh, I have to know that it's revelation. No, you don't. Be good. Be worthy. Do your best, prepare, and go and open your mouth and it will be filled. And you don't have to know in every moment that it's revelation. You just need to have the faith to press forward and go. Okay? Now, Faith is the principle of action and of power. 
we assist the Holy Ghost the best when all of the things that we invite them to do to prepare, all of the things that we do to help interact, to edify, always leads to invitations to act. Now, we talk about making and keeping commitments, but the sequence of acting in accordance with the teachings of Christ invites the power of the Holy Ghost. We testify as a preparation to invite someone to act. We answer a question in, as, a, as a preparation to invite someone to act. Everything that we do leads to inviting, enticing an investigator to act in accordance with the teachings they're learning and hopefully increasingly coming to feel are true. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Something I've been thinking about this whole time is just that perspective is everything. And as long as we remember that it's not about us, we're not here to baptize for us or to teach for us. It's for the Lord. And if we really strive to keep the spirit with us, people will know that. And we'll, we won't walk out of a lesson thinking, oh, I did great. Like, that was me. But we'll say, wow, the Holy Spirit was really strong in that lesson. And they were able to feel that. And that's just what I've been thinking about, that it's not about us. It's about the Lord. Good. You have both made the comment, I have been thinking all throughout this conversation. I've been thinking. Revelation is thoughts to the mind and feelings to the heart. When an investigator says something like, well, you know, when you're here, I keep thinking about. Or as I, as I read the Book of Mormon, I felt. Those are some of their first experiences with the spiritual gift of revelation. And that's where you can help draw that out of them so that they more fully appreciate and understand spiritually what's taking place. Okay, I'm going to ask two quick questions and we'll summarize this session with these two questions. What's the role of the Holy Ghost in conversion? Elder. To, um, to convert the investigator. <laughs> you couldn't say it any better. He is the teacher, the testifier. He is the influence that can help a heart to change. What's our role in assisting the Holy Ghost as the teacher? Elder. To create an environment in the lesson to where the, the investigator will invite the spirit into their heart. Good. So that the investigator is pulling it into the heart through what they do in response to our invitations to act. Other things that we do to assist the Holy Ghost. Elder. We bring it unto them. Good. And we invite them to act to help it go from unto into the heart. They have to do that. We assist, we invite, we entice, but ultimately the investigator has to do that. So what will be different in you as a representative of the Lord as a result of what we've discussed in this 20 minutes? Elder. Uh, relying more on the spirit, but obviously planning myself and things like that, but understanding, just like Elder Triana said, changing my mindset to rather than being about me, um, it's, it's all about the spirit. That's the thing that Good. I need to do. Others, Elder, what's going to be different? Listening in the, in the lessons where my companion is talking, I'll be listening all the time. Good. Elder. To have a, a humble heart, to be ready to have the Spirit with me all the time, so that my investigator can see that I'm sincere, and that they can receive the, the feelings of the Spirit as I have as well. Good. Great answer. Elder? I would, it would go along with what Elder Triana said, to look at myself as the instrument, and not as the Holy Ghost being the instrument, but that I am the instrument in the Lord's hands. Why do you think that's a big change? Because I, I think it removes, removes pride. It, it, it makes you more humble. It makes you more dependent upon the Lord. And it makes me want to, want to plan more with my studies so I can be a better fashioned instrument in the salvation of someone else. Without the power of the Holy Ghost, we are utterly incapable of doing what we have been called to do. Do you really think that our capacity to explain the principles of the gospel is going to persuade someone in and of itself. This is about a mighty change of heart that can only come through the influence of the Holy Ghost. And we are the Lord's agents to help that spirit come into the lives of people, to help them learn how to invite it into their hearts. As we end, I want to declare my witness. 
as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, to you, my fellow servants, I testify that he lives. God, the Eternal Father, and his Son, Jesus Christ, are real, and they live. The Father and the Son appeared to Joseph Smith. The fullness of the gospel has been restored. And I testify of the living reality of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, who is the instrument of enduring conversion. I declare that witness in the sacred name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 My dear elders and sisters, it is a privilege to speak to you in this historic broadcast to missionaries all over the world. I'm grateful to participate with the other members of the Missionary Executive Council under the direction of Elder Oaks, and I'm grateful for the assignment that I've been given, which is taken from Chapter 11 of Preach My Gospel. We invite, they commit, we follow up. As you well know, your purpose as missionaries is to invite others to come into Christ by helping them receive the restored gospel through faith in Jesus Christ and His atonement, repentance, baptism, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. Faith in Jesus Christ is a principle of action and power, and the first principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Moroni, we are taught that it is by faith that miracles are wrought. Elders and sisters, conversion is a miracle and begins with the exercise of faith in Jesus Christ. Your role, as described in your purpose, is to help others exercise faith in Jesus Christ unto repentance in order to experience the miracle of conversion. You do this not just by sharing an important message, but by inviting them to act rather than being acted upon and thus become agents rather than objects. There is no question that the message you share is a life-altering and eternity-changing message. It is the most significant message anyone could share, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the restoration of His Church in these latter days. However, hearing the message, even understanding the message, is not an exercise of their faith and generally does not lead to conversion. It may provide some motivation, but without your invitation, they are not likely to act and exercise their agency. Now, that invitation to act generally includes the question, will you? But it involves much more. An invitation to act, such as to read and pray regarding the Book of Mormon or to attend church, must be extended in such a way as to lead to a commitment on their part to exercise active faith in the principles you've taught them. Commitment is an essential part of repentance and is a crucial step in the conversion process. Preach My Gospel teaches the Lord's pattern in extending a bold commitment invitation, and each step in the pattern is essential. First, your invitation to act must be specific, direct, and clear. You can leave no doubt as to what you are asking them to do, so that as they commit to act, there will be no confusion as to what is expected. Be bold. Be confident. Don't be aggressive or pushy as you invite people to make commitments. Boldness shows your faith that obedience to the Lord's commandments brings blessings. The second step in a commitment invitation is to promise blessings. These promised blessings serve as incentive to act and provide powerful motivation to obey God. As the Lord's authorized representative, share the feelings that you've experienced, share the blessings that you've experienced, and don't hesitate to promise the blessings that He has promised. You exercise your own faith as you promise with confidence. The third step in a commitment invitation is to boldly testify of the truthfulness of what you have taught. As you share your testimony throughout each lesson, you create an environment for those you teach to feel the Spirit and confirm that what you are teaching and what you invite them to do comes from the Lord. As they feel the spirit that accompanies your sincere testimony, their commitment to act will be strengthened. Now, an example from the Old Testament found in 1 Kings chapter 17 demonstrates each of the three steps and the result of an effective commitment invitation. In the first few verses, we learn of the prophet Elijah 
and the drought brought on due to the wickedness of the people. As the drought becomes more severe, the Lord instructs Elijah to get thee to Zarephath, where he is told that the Lord has commanded a widow woman to provide him with food. Now, for now, Elijah does not know anything about the widow's circumstances, other than she will provide for him, and so he begins his trip to Zarephath. We then read, When he came to the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. So Elijah asked her for some water. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. So Elijah still does not know of her condition, but he's about to learn as she responds to his request. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise, and behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. I suppose that learning of her condition was somewhat of a shock for Elijah, considering that the Lord had sent him to this widow for the purpose of being fed. What happens next is a lesson for every missionary. Rather than explain that as a prophet, he would provide her with all the food she needed, Elijah knew, as you do, that the Lord could bless her far more than he could, and that blessings she needed would only come through the exercise of faith. His role as yours was to invite her to act, to become an agent rather than an object, and thus qualify for the blessings she and her son sorely needed. Elijah responded to the widow's description of her condition with a very specific, clear, and direct invitation. In verse 13 we read, And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. The widow now knew exactly what Elijah expected from her. But as we know from Preach My Gospel, the invitation alone is not sufficient to motivate or inspire action. For the widow, there was still no reason to commit to act. Even without chapter 11 of Preach My Gospel, Elijah knew there were more steps to a commitment invitation. After explaining what she needed to do, he continued, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. With this testimony and promise, the invitation was now complete. The widow now knew what was expected, had heard the testimony of a servant of the Lord, and received a promise of future blessings if she were obedient to the request. She was now an agent, not an object, and was in a position to exercise her faith. Verses 15 and 16 tell us the result. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of, oil, of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Elders and sisters, Elijah did not coerce, he did not force or insist. He extended a commitment invitation following the same pattern the Lord has established for our day. Without an appropriate invitation, given her circumstances, the widow would never have given away the last bit of food she was preparing for her and for her son, and they would have died. They would not have received the blessings they so desperately needed. Those you teach are in a similar situation, though they may not recognize it. Elder Holland makes this clear and preached my gospel when he taught, quote, this is eternal life. Eternity hangs in the balance. It is the most important path this investigator will ever walk. But if he or she doesn't know that, at least you do. So take control of this situation, unquote. Because you do know the importance of this path, your role following an appropriate commitment invitation is to follow up. We invite, they commit, we follow up. Even with the truth, as we know, change can be hard. You are there to help strengthen the resolve of your investigators and to help them keep their commitments. Because unlike the widow Zarephath, they may not act as quickly or decisively as you'd like. As taught and preached my gospel, your follow-up may include brief daily contact where possible, answering questions, teaching additional lessons, 
perhaps reading together from the Book of Mormon, helping them identify the blessings they receive as they keep commitments, sincerely and frequently praising them for their efforts and any other appropriate activity as directed by the Spirit. Elders and sisters, you are inviters. Throughout your mission, you should be saying the words, will you, followed up with the promise of blessings and sincere, powerful testimony wherever you go, all day, every day. Once the Lord can see that they are acting, revelation will come to confirm the truthfulness of the gospel message that you share. I bear you my witness that the Lord's pattern found in a commitment invitation is inspired, and if extended properly, including promised blessings, powerful testimony, and earnest follow-up, will result in more of God's children experiencing the miracle of conversion. We share a message like no other, but more than the message is necessary for our investigators to become agents rather than objects and exercise their faith in Jesus Christ. We invite, they commit, we follow up. God the Father lives. His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, is our Savior and Redeemer. He directs this divine work through a living prophet, Thomas S. Monson. I testify that the Book of Mormon is true and that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is God's church and kingdom on earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. We will now stand in nations all around the earth to sing Hark All Ye Nations. Following the hymn, we will view instruction from Sister Bonnie L. Oscarson. Following her remarks, we will watch another training session that was conducted by Elder L. Whitney Clayton, the senior president of the presidency of the 70, in which I was invited to participate. We will watch that instruction, and then we will listen to a special musical number, I'll Go Where You Want Me To Go.
Elders and sisters, what a privilege it is to be here with you today and participate in this worldwide broadcast, training broadcast for missionaries throughout the world. I appreciate you being willing to be here and share your testimonies today. We're going to have a discussion about one of the fundamentals from Preach My Gospel, which um, has to do with teaching people, not lessons. And I know you've had a lot of experience with that in your mission, so I'm hoping that you can share with us some of the things you've learned. Um, you know, Preach My Gospel is a great resource for teaching us the basic essentials and principles of the gospel that we need to have in our minds and hearts to teach people. And um, But it's not intended, and you all know this, you've been taught this, that we teach rote or memorized discussions to those that we teach. And so um, we need to learn to be guided. Um, you just had a wonderful discussion with, with Elder Bednar about being guided by the Spirit. And so I'd like to continue that discussion and talk about how you meet the needs of those whom you teach. And um, there's a wonderful promise that's given in the Doctrine and Covenants that I'd like to ask someone to read if you would be willing to volunteer. It's found in Doctrine and Covenants section 100, verses five and six. And um, just think about what this promise implies for you as missionaries. Do I have a volunteer? Yes, Sister Law, would you read it for us, please? You said four and five? Four and, uh, no, five and six. Oh, five so and six. So section 105 and six, yeah. Therefore, verily I say unto you, lift up your voices unto this people, speak the thoughts that I shall put into your hearts, that, and you shall not be confounded before men. For it shall be given you in the very hour, yea, in the very moment, what ye shall say. Isn't that a magnificent promise? that it will be given to you in the very hour that you need it, what you shall say. But I, I think that this scripture is really dependent on some things that we need to understand. And so I'd like to read two more short scriptures that, that tell us what helps us, um, helps this promise come to pass. So they're all, also both in the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, and so if someone could look up Doctrine and Covenants 84, verse 85, and then someone else, DNC 1121. Um, this is something that needs to take place before this promise that we just read, that it will be given to you in the very hour what you need, to, takes place. And to me, this principle, this principle that these two scriptures teach is at the very essence of Preach My Gospel. So could I have someone read um, 84, 85? Yes, Elder Armstrong. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Neither take ye thought beforehand what ye shall say, but treasure up in your minds continually the words of life, and it shall be given you in the very hour that portion that shall be meted unto every man. Fabulous, thank you. And how about 1121? Yes. Seek not to declare my word, but first seek to obtain my word, and then shall your tongue be loosed. Then if you desire, you shall have my spirit and my word, yea, the power of God unto the convincing of man. Okay, what do you, t what do you all learn from these two scriptures that your responsibility is? Yes, Elder Fu. I think again, it goes off of what we were discussing with Elder Bednar, that we are the instruments and the spirit is the converter and we as missionaries need to be everything that we said before worthy and um, obviously planning for those lessons so that the spirit can really be the thing that brings to our remembrance what the investigator needs. Fabulous. Where's the spirit going to get the information from? Yes. The spirit will get the information from our own minds. Okay. He's, he puts words into our mouths when we open them, but it's up to us to have those words already there for him to use. Where do you it's, get those words? Go back to those two scriptures and what did they say? There was a part that said, treasure up. And there was another one that says, first seek to obtain my word. What, what responsibilities does that place upon you? Yes, Elder Triana. I think we have to use well our morning schedule to study at eight, like personal, and then do our conventional study at nine o'clock and use it like very well. So we can really obtain that word and the spirit can use that for others. I, I that's fabulous. First seek to obtain my word and treasure up. Um, I've heard it compared to a treasure chest that we have to put something into that treasure chest first through our diligent efforts and study. Um, and that's where your, your personal study and your companionship study comes in. And then when it's time that you need to draw something out, that the Holy Ghost has something to draw out to give those investigators, there's something in that treasure chest to draw upon. But it, it puts some responsibility on your shoulders too to fill that treasure chest, doesn't it? I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about your experiences in meeting the needs of, of those whom you teach. 
Um, how do you understand the needs of the investigators that you teach? Yes. Well, first, listening to them and what they say. Because if we're not listening, then we don't really, we can't really know what their needs are specifically. That's fabulous. In, intently listening and really paying attention to what they're saying and mm -hmm. hearing. What else? I think Elder Holland said it very well in one of his talks again, is that we need to go where the investigator is. Mm -hmm. And so wherever they are in their life experience right now, we need to go where they are in order to understand, like Sister Pijak said, how they're feeling, what they need as the investigators. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yes. I feel like sometimes we don't even need to know what their needs are. I mean, that would be the ideal. But if we're truly being led by the Spirit, we can say the things that they need. We can do the things that they need without specifically knowing. And I feel like the more in tune we are with the Spirit, the better we can help people. Okay. Being in tune with the Spirit is absolutely important. Yes, Elder Cochran. Um, I would say planning for your investigators because mm -hmm. that's sacred time that we have in the morning and at night. And um, if we don't try to come up with a plan to help them, well, then we will never be able to discern or adjust their needs. Very good. What part does asking inspired questions come in to understanding where your investigators are at and helping the spirit to guide you? Yes. Um, when we ask inspired questions, it gives them an opportunity to share a portion of their testimony. Mm -hmm. So we not only are able to understand what their concerns are, but we're able to understand where, the, where they are on a spiritual level, where their testimony is. Fabulous. Very good. Yes. One Percy. thing that I, that I thought of when you asked, what, what do we need to be able to understand them, to mm -hmm. be able to teach according mm -hmm. to their needs? And I remember Elder Ringwood came and visited our mission not so long ago. And he taught us, he, he talked about um, the, the handbook, handbook two. And these are the things under ministering that it says. It says, remembering their names and becoming acquainted with them loving them without judging them, watching over them and strengthening their faith one by one as the Savior did. And the last one is establishing sincere friendship with them and visiting them in their homes and elsewhere. Well, you're a testimony to great note taking and that's now helping you inform your missionary. Those are, that's a great list of, of ways that we can meet the needs of our investigators. Well, um, just We've had just a short discussion on this, but if you had to summarize something that, that, has stand, st that stands out to you about what you've learned about teaching people, not lessons, what would it be? What would, what's a, a lesson that we could draw out of this? Taking the lessons and then applying it to, to exactly what they need in their lives to help them to really feel that spirit and to know that our Savior Jesus Christ loves them. Okay. And what responsibility do you have? Yes. I think we have to, to obtain the word. We have to do our studies. We have to do our part in order to, to help them. Have to fill the treasure chest, yes. And yes. Um, I think we have, to, we have to put in the work, not only in our, in our studies of the scriptures, but as a companionship during our daily and weekly planning sessions to look at what scriptures we feel would be best suited for, for their needs to help them. And then be open. Sometimes you head to someone's house with the thought that we're going to teach a lesson on the atonement. And when you get there, maybe what the Spirit directs you to teach is the restoration. And I think you've all had that experience where you plan as, as best you can, but then you open yourself to the Spirit as you talked about with Elder Bednar. Well, elders and sisters, um, I have felt of your spirit today and, and feel uplifted for having been with you. And I would like to leave my testimony with you too, that this work that you're engaged in is among the most important work on the face of the earth that's taking place. You're truly accomplishing your Heavenly Father's work, and you are representatives of Jesus Christ in this work. And um, I feel, looking into your faces and feeling of your spirits, that the work is in good hands. You are teaching with the Spirit. I testify to you that Jesus Christ lives, and that He is our Savior and our Redeemer, and that He directs this work. And I know that as you put forth diligent efforts and seek the Spirit, that He will bless you with success in your own lives, and you will change lives of those people that you teach. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Elders and sisters, I'm delighted to be here with you and delighted to be with Elder Nielsen, who's the executive, executive director of the missionary department. This is an exciting topic, and we're so happy to have this opportunity to talk with you about working with members, retention, and activation. We're going to begin by talking <clears throat> about finding people to teach. And as we talk about this subject, I'd appreciate it if you'd turn, please, to section 42 of the Doctrine and Covenants and read with me, if you would, please, verses 6, 7, and 8. 
Would one of you let me know when you're there? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sister P. Jack? Yes. Would you please read verses 6, 7, and 8? Yes. And ye shall go forth in the power of my spirit, preaching my gospel two by two in my name, lifting up your voices as with the sound of a trump, declaring my word like unto angels of God. And ye shall go forth baptizing with water, saying, Repent ye, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And from this place ye shall go forth into the regions westward. And inasmuch as ye shall find them that will receive you, ye shall build up my church in every region. Thank you. You've probably read that, those verses before. I want to emphasize three words, or four words, I guess, that... Uh, are repeated in each of those verses. Ye shall go forth. Do you see that part about ye? Mm -hmm. When we talk about finding, we want to make sure that we're talking about our own responsibility to find people to teach. We can help find people to teach when we develop the faith to do so. We need to develop the faith to find. Quickly, in, in your mind, how do you think we go about doing that? How do we develop the, the faith to find? What do you think? Please, Elder. I think practice is practice. a good one. I mean, faith is a principle of action and power. So if we're not prepared to act in the first place and try, then that will never build at all. Good. Thank you. Please. Prayer. Good. Wonderful. What else? Yes. Good attitude. A good attitude. Thank you. Those are good answers. Let's take another one. We always find when we teach and we teach when we find. What does that mean to you? How do you understand that? Any thoughts? Please, Elder Bigham. I think always testifying, always looking for opportunities to share the gospel with. And when you do have someone you're teaching, always asking them for, for referrals or who they know that we can go and share this message with. Good. Thank you. If we're teaching someone, we constantly ask. We always look for opportunities to ask about who people know and who else do they know. The famous who else part, right? It's not enough just to ask who do you know. We always ask the second question, who else? And what's the third question? Who else? Who else? Who else? Know? And the fourth, <laughs> right? Yeah. We always do that. Thank you. Next, a good missionary will what? Will someone, one of you read that, Elder Triana? Will you finish that one, please? Yes. A good missionary will always open his or her mouth with everyone. With everyone. The word always is kind of a big word. It doesn't take very many, many letters to spell it, but it means a lot. Mm. Always means what? Always. Always. always, yes. Thank you. That's a great definition for always. It means always. Thank you. We're going to look now at something that I think you'll find of interest. We're going to look at some missionary survey information. This is a slide that shows you information from international missions. That means outside the United States and outside Canada. You'll see that there are bars in gold and in blue. The gold represent missionaries' own efforts and the blue represent the efforts of members, working with members. We on the same page? Mm -hmm. Now, as we look at this, the left-hand mm -hmm. pair of columns uh, is entitled, Finds the Most Investigators. The right hand leads to the most baptisms. You'll see that in the international areas, missionaries' own efforts find the most investigators by comparison to working with members. But what happens? with respect to baptisms. Just the opposite. More people are baptized from working with members than from our own missionary initiated contacting. Do you see that? Does that make, is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me show you what happens in the United States and Canada. What do we see in this one? The same thing. We see that missionaries find more people to teach on their own than they do working with members but they baptize dramatically more people from working with members than they do from their own context. What can we take away? What can we learn from these two slides? What do you think? Please, Elder? The importance of working with members. The importance <laughs> of working with, with members. We must have planted that answer with you. <laughs> that was a good answer. That's exactly right. That's the point, is that when we work with members, we can be much more effective. Now, I want to make sure one thing's clear. We don't mean to diminish our own responsibility to find. Always still means always. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to open our mouth constantly, to be using every opportunity we can to find. Okay, are we on the same page? Mm -hmm. We're going to look next at working with active members. How do we best work with active members? But as we do this, again, I just want to, to make this point one more time. Members want to do the right thing. They want to be good missionaries themselves. They want to help you. 
we're going to talk about how we can make it easier for them. The very first thing about making, e making it easier for them is by being a great missionary yourself, opening your mouth, finding constantly, never letting down, earning the members' respect by the way that you serve as a missionary. That's the first step. But we'll now turn to this slide and learn some things that will make it easier. Here's a mistake that's fairly common. It is that a missionary or a pair of missionaries show up at a member's home and they simply ask for a referral. There's a better way. We ask them questions that start with, who do you know? Who do you know? So we're going to complete that, uh, that thought now by asking you to read these slides. Let's just ask Elder Von Dorsten if you'd start. Will you read the first one underneath this, uh, who do you know, and start, your, start what you read with, who do you know, will you please? Yes, sir. <clears throat> who do you know who would be interested in and benefit from the gospel message? Thank you. Elder? Uh, who do you know who has an illness in the family? Next. Who do you know who has recently moved? Who do you know who recently had a baby? Who do you know who recently had a death in the family? Thank you. Who do you know who recently changed jobs? Why do you think that these kinds of questions might be more likely to be useful in working with an active member of the church in trying to find people to teach? What would, what would there be in these questions in your view? Any ideas? Please, Elder. It's specific and it's not general. It's Good. It's, spe it's specific. It's not general. Very helpful. Please, sister. These are people who have had a change in their life, which means they're either more humble and more receptive, or that there's something that we can focus on. Like, if they've moved, I've moved a lot. The plan of salvation really took on a new meaning to me after those moves. Thank you. Great personal comment as well. Please, Elder. Uh, the, the biggest thing is members know these things are happening around the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. They know that people have recently <laughs> moved in. They've had babies. And they... They know those people very well. So they're likely to trigger a thought. These, these questions would trigger a thought. Please, Elder. Uh, now that we're on recently moved, it reminded me of, of a bit ago when we were tracting on the street. We asked the sister if she knew who, who had recently moved in and who lived around her. She came out with a paper with a map of all her neighbors' names. <laughs> she said, this is so-and-so. They recently moved in. They just built a house. It was great. Inspired questions. You know when to ask what question. We need to get her to move to every ward. <laughs> Please. I think it's a good opportunity to get them thinking about those people, yeah, but also an opportunity for them to think of what they could do to help those people also. Thank you. Great, great observations. I've appreciated your responses. Let me take you to, a, to a Alma chapter 32, and we'll read a verse there. In Alma 32, you'll recall that... Uh, Alma was teaching in, uh, he, was, he was teaching the Zoramites, and as he was teaching, he ran into this situation. Someone came up behind him and asked this question. This is verse 6, uh, pardon me, verse 5. He said, What shall these my brethren do, for they are despised of all men because of their poverty, yea, and more especially by our priests? And then going to the end of that verse, What shall we do? Verse 6, when Alma heard this, he turned him about his face immediately towards him, and he beheld with great joy, for he beheld that their afflictions had truly humbled them, a point one of you made, and that they were in a preparation to hear the word. These kinds of questions help identify people who are in a preparation to hear the word. Elder Nielsen. Thank you, President Clayton. We want to talk now about another group of people. Elder, would you read this slide? How do we work best with less active and part member families? Sometimes we call this the gold mine because they're less active members and part members. Who, who do you think their friends are? Elder Triana, who do you think their friends are? Non-members. Non-members. Mm -hmm. Many times our active members don't have many non-member friends, but they have great non-member friends. We co if, if I were to just take you to a gold mine and say, go mine the gold, you might not know how to do that. So we want to talk about how to mine this wonderful gold mine. The first thing that we need to know is that these less active members, these part members, all at some time in their life stood in a chapel 
wearing white clothes, and they were baptized. And then they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. It was a wonderful day for them. It was a happy day for them. And now they're not with us. And we need to rekindle that faith. So let's talk about, about some things we can do to mine this wonderful gold mine and to find people to teach and in the same, at the same time bring these people back to church. So w we ended off with you. Did you read the last one? You go ahead, Elder. Treat them like an investigator. What do you think that means to treat a, a less active or a part member family like an investigator? To be able to just start new, just I guess to like I said, just start new and just have that that mindset that these people don't know as much, and we need to help them to gain the understanding so that they can really feel the spirit and then come back to church. Very good. So. So with a new investigator, would you just walk to their door and say, would you come to church next Sunday? No. But we do that a lot of times with less active. We just go and say, will you come to church next Sunday without teaching them mm -hmm. a lesson or a allowing them to feel the spirit? Elder, let's read this next one. Invite them to hear the lessons. Now, a less active person is going to say, I'm already a member. I don't need to hear the lessons. And you can say to them, well, can we practice on you? Can you allow us to share a message with you of, of the restoration again and let them understand the gospel of Jesus Christ again? Our goal, as Elder Bednar taught us, is that we want to connect them to heaven, right? Mm -hmm. We'll go back to you, Elder, on the back row. Teach the first vision. Elder, why do you think we would want to teach the first vision? Well, they've heard it before, you know, like you said earlier, and hopefully that can um, bring back memories of their baptism or when they heard of the restoration before. Very good. My experience with all of you is that when I hear you teach the first vision, it brings tears to my eyes because it's, it's the very first thing that started my testimony as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And when you do that, when you teach the first vision to a less active member or to a part member family, they begin to feel that again. They feel the spirit of the restoration. Let's see if we can read this one for us, Elder. Uh, rekindle their faith. How do you think we would do that, Elder? How would we rekindle the faith of a less active or a part member family? Um, well, like the first one, treating them like an investigator, inviting them to do things, uh, teaching them the lessons. Very good. So can we just go into the home of a part member family or a less active family and just, and just act like that they're a new investigator and teach them and treat them like they are? instead of going in and just saying, will you come to church next Sunday? <laughs> or leaving them a message. We need to leave them with an invitation after we've taught them. Oops. Elder, would you read this one for us? As they begin to feel the Spirit, ask them, who do you know? So why would we do that, Elder? Why would we ask them who they know? Because they have friends who are non-members. Very good. And we always teach when we find, and we find when we teach. This is our gold mine. Once they're feeling the Spirit, once you connect them to heaven again, once they feel the Spirit of the restoration and the first vision again, they'll start to think, who else do I know that would be interested in this? You can, all, you can begin to find as you work with these less active members. Let's look at this last one, Elder. Would you read this one for us? Bring them back and baptize their family members and friends. Good. So, in the process of finding through less active members and part member families, we want to be sure that we bring them back in the process, right? That we, we invite them to come back. There's another group that I, we'd like to talk about. Well, let me just mention this, that through this process, we unite families and we teach those who have a member friend. If you can understand that, you'll see that these less active and part member families are our gold mine. We just need to know how to mine. Let's look at this next one. How do we work best with new members? And we'll read this first phrase. And this was a change that was made. Sister Pekjak, would you read this one for us? Yes. When possible, missionaries will work closely with each new member for at least three to four months after baptism and continue to keep close to him or her for at least a year. Hopefully, missionaries will maintain these relationships for many years and even generations. Very good. So we always continue to work with them to retain them, right? And let's just read this one more statement. Go ahead, okay. sister. 
Missionaries will take the lead in reteaching all five of the lessons after baptism. All of you know that, right? Mm -hmm. We teach the, the five lessons. And what would we do with a, a, a new member? Could we ask them, who else do you know? Mm -hmm. Our new members have a lot of non-member friends, don't they? So here's a question. We always, people always say to me, well, I'm activating right now, or I'm retaining right now, or right now I'm teaching an investigator. It's all one big work. And so we ask the question, is it possible to activate and retain and still be finding? Is it possible? Yes. 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 Absolutely. We always find when we teach, and we teach when we find, and we always open our mouth to everyone. And so elders and sisters, my hope for you is that you'll learn how to use this amazing gold mine we have by connecting these less active and part member families to heaven, but you're always finding while you teach. We don't separate that out and say, right now I'm activating. Right now I'm retaining. We, we do both. President Clayton. Thank you. No matter what you're doing, no matter where you are, this is why we do it. Uh, Sister Lynn, would you read that, please? Sure. Our purpose is to teach repentance and baptize converts. So with that in mind, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, no matter with whom we're speaking, that's why we're doing it. So we can find people to whom we can teach the doctrine of repentance. We can baptize them as real converts. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, we would like to ask you what you think are the major takeaways from this presentation. Would you help us with that, please? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yes, Elder? I think changing, well, for me, it's changing my perspective and my mindset about the Holy Ghost and his role in missionary work and also my role and how it all kind of fits together. Good. Thank you. Please. It's not really a takeaway. It's an experience. In our area, we're working with a less active one who wasn't really progressing and we're considering dropping her when we both felt like we shouldn't do that. And so we went back and we found that her mom was visiting for her two months and this woman who was less active is also a recent convert. And so as we've been teaching her mom, she's been sharing her experiences of what she felt when she was first converted. And she's coming to church more now. And the mom's going to be baptized soon. And so we've been able to find someone. And we've also been able to help strengthen someone. So definitely possible to do all three together. Good. Thank you. Definitely possible to do all three together. Another comment? Yes, please, Elder. Um, when we had the slide up um, about working with active members and asking them all of those questions, um, we need to be persistent when we do so. If we were to ask all those questions, the it would trigger in the members' minds, you know, these missionaries are persistent. They want to find someone to teach, and uh, we're mo more likely uh, to find someone to teach and to baptize. Good, thank you. Wonderful observations. Please, Elder. Something that I think it's all the things that the slide has been going on, it's built up for us so we can fulfill our purpose by teaching repentance and baptizing converts. Exactly right. Good. Thank you very much. Yes. We've talked about less active and part member families and, and uniting families. And, and I had the experience two weeks ago to, to sit in the Salt Lake Temple with a family that, that I watched his father seven months ago baptize his daughter. And with, through the bishop, and through their one mission later, work to activate that family and be them sealed together for time and all eternity. Working with members and activating families, it's an opportunity to unite families. Missionary work isn't just, it isn't just an experience for, for me. It's an experience to unite families for eternity. Great answers. Thank you very, very much. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for your service. And thanks to all the rest of the missionaries around the world who are hearing this presentation as well. The gospel is true. The restoration is a fact. Joseph Smith was a prophet. There is a God in heaven. He is our Father, and His Son Jesus Christ is our Savior, and this is His church. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. amen.
We will now have the opportunity to learn from Elder Dallin H. Oaks. Following Elder Oaks' remarks, we will sing More Holiness Give Me, and Sister Aurora Lopez Gonzalez will offer our benediction. Elder Oaks is the chairman of the Missionary Executive Council. He has served as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles since April 7, 1984. Elder Oaks, we are honored to receive your counsel and direction. My beloved fellow missionaries, hasn't this been a wonderful two hours together? I have rejoiced in all of the teachings. Last month, our Missionary Executive Council posted a two-hour broadcast to all mission presidents and their companions. Now we have this unique opportunity to speak to all of our 75,000 missionaries in the world. We love you as servants of the Lord and welcome this opportunity to help you in the great work you are doing. Today we've been taught fundamentals from Preach My Gospel. Elder Anderson taught our purpose as full-time missionaries, which is to teach the doctrine of Christ. As he taught, always keep your testimony of the Savior and his gospel as the most important part of your work. Elder Bednar described how conversion comes through the Holy Ghost as you and your companion do what is necessary to assure that the Holy Ghost testifies to those you teach. Bishop Waddell taught that investigators must act in order for the Holy Ghost to teach them and that missionaries must invite investigators to act and then follow up to be sure they are moving forward on the road to conversion. Sister Oscarson reminded us that we teach people, not lessons. We always prepare and we are constantly treasuring up. But as we teach, we carefully listen to the spirit which will lead us to teach what each investigator needs. Finally, we cannot teach if we don't have investigators. A major part of your work is to find. President Clayton and Elder Nielsen taught that we should always find when we teach. All missionaries must develop the faith and skill to find. The best finding is done when we work with members. As President Monson taught us, now is the time for members and missionaries to come together. Your best success will come as you work with ward councils and ward mission leaders, and as you are seeking to retain and to activate. Behind each reactivated contact are family members and friends who are golden prospects. The more people we find and teach, the more we will baptize. Now that we're past the large expenditures of time necessary to adjust, adjust to big variations in the numbers of missionaries, especially sister missionaries, we can now teach an improved focus on the doctrinal purpose of missionary work, which is to teach repentance and baptize converts to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what our Savior commanded us to do, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. During his message to the new mission presidents last June, President Russell M. Nelson said, more than anything else, we want our missionaries to have the doctrine of Christ engraved in their hearts rooted deeply in the marrow of their bones." End of quote. Truly, all missionary work is founded on the doctrine of Christ. It is the pole star of our precious handbook, Preach My Gospel, which we want you to study daily. The doctrine of Christ was described by the Savior himself. Quote, and this is my doctrine, and it is the doctrine which the Father hath given unto me. And I bear record of the Father, and the Father beareth record of me, 
And the Holy Ghost beareth record of the Father and me. And I bear record that the Father commandeth all men everywhere to repent and believe in me. And whoso believeth in me and is baptized, the same shall be saved, and they are they who shall inherit the kingdom of God. Later, the Savior repeated his doctrine in these words. Now this is the commandment, repent all ye ends of the earth and come unto me and be baptized in my name that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost, that if ye then endure to the end, ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. And thus we see that the doctrine of Christ is that we must repent and be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and endure to the end in order to be saved in the celestial kingdom of God. Missionaries are called to teach that doctrine. In this unique worldwide gathering, it is most important to remind you missionaries who you are and what you are called to do. If you understand these two things, you have the big picture and the basis to understand everything else about being a missionary. Who are you? You are sons and daughters of God. Everything else we are is subordinate to that. Think of it. We are royalty, the sons and daughters of God. What are you called to do? President John Taylor, himself a great missionary, taught that missionaries should not lose themselves in little things and thus lose sight of the great purpose of their calling. He continued, quote, We forget that this kingdom was established upon the earth for the purpose of introducing righteousness and the laws of heaven upon the earth and of blessing mankind and of saving the living and the dead. We forget what we're here for and what the kingdom of God is established for. It is not for you or for me or anybody else alone. It is for the interests of the world and the salvation of mankind." End of quote. That is what the Lord has called you, his sons and daughters, to do. You're not called to preach what is politically correct or personally comfortable. You are not called to invite people to join a social club whose rules are made by its members. You are called to testify of Jesus Christ and to invite people to do what he has required to come unto him and walk the path he has defined by his doctrines to reach exaltation in the celestial kingdom. Can you imagine what it would mean for the world in which we live, what it would mean for each family and each person in the world if everyone understood God's plan for his children, and if even a small fraction tried to keep his commandments and assist him in this great work? If you and I can only understand what that would mean for the world, we will understand that being a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ called to proclaim his gospel, called to bring people to him and to establish his church is the most important work anyone can do in mortality. Young missionaries, in time to come, you will understand your unique opportunity and responsibility better than you do now. You will come to realize how important this period of full-time missionary work is for the work of the Lord and for your own personal life. I urge you to pray, to understand, and to have strength to act upon that importance so that in time to come, you will not look back on your missionary service with the regret that comes from dishonor or even from opportunities lost and blessings postponed. Pray that with the help of our Savior, you will act so that you can look back on your missionary service 
with the sweet recollections that come from being faithful and true. As servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is critical that we understand the role of his atonement in our lives and in the lives of those whom we teach. This is an essential part of the doctrine of Christ. The Book of Mormon teaches that the Savior does not redeem men in their sins. The Savior came to redeem men from their sins upon the conditions of repentance. One of those conditions of repentance is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, including faith in and reliance upon his atoning sacrifice. As Amulek taught, he that exercises no faith unto repentance is exposed to the whole law of the demands of justice. Therefore, only unto him that has faith unto repentance is brought about the great and eternal plan of redemption. The Savior taught this repentance when he said that his atoning sacrifice was for all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. When a person has gone through the repentance process, the Savior does more than cleanse that person from sin. He also gives him or her new strength. That strengthening is essential for us to realize the purpose of the cleansing, which is to return to our Heavenly Father. To be admitted to His presence, we must be more than clean. We must also be changed from a morally weak person who has sinned into a strong person with the strength to resist sin and the spiritual stature to dwell in the presence of God. That is what it means to be saved. You will understand from what I have just said why it is so important for missionaries to teach repentance. In our day, the Lord has commanded missionaries to say nothing but repentance unto this generation. The Lord explained further, Verily, verily, I say unto you, those who believe not on your words and are not baptized in water in my name for the remission of their sins, that they may receive the Holy Ghost, shall be damned, and shall not come into my Father's kingdom, where my Father and I am." We do not preach and teach in order to bring people into the church or to increase our membership. We do not find and teach just to persuade people to live better lives. We honor and appreciate the many ministers and others involved in efforts that make bad men good and good men better. That is important, but we offer something more. From modern revelation, we know that children of God can qualify for a significant heaven or degree of glory without the ordinances of His Church. As missionaries called by Him and preaching the fullness of His doctrine, we are concerned with something more than a lesser kingdom of glory. The fundamental purpose of our missionary work is to teach the Word of God that men and women cannot be saved in the highest degree of glory, the celestial kingdom, without faith in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Further, we teach that the only way to lay claim to the ultimate merits of His atonement is to follow His commands, repent and be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and the ordinances of the temple, and endure to the end. Those who do so can be exalted in the celestial kingdom instead of being damned in a lesser status or kingdom. No one else can do this. Other churches cannot do it. Good Christian living cannot do it. Good faith, good desires, and good reasoning cannot do it. Only a man or woman teaching the fullness of the gospel with priesthood authority can teach this. And only a man exercising the priesthood of God can administer 
a baptism that will satisfy the divine decree, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You missionaries who are on the front line in this great effort need to remember that the baptism we seek is the baptism that follows sincere repentance. The baptism that is part of a conscious change and coming unto Christ with a deliberate decision to come into the fold of God and to be called his people. In the 18th chapter of Messiah, Alma concludes his teaching about the burdens we covenant to bear by characterizing baptism as a witness before him that ye have entered into a covenant with him, that ye will serve him and keep his commandments, that he may pour out his spirit more abundantly upon you. Six months after the church was established, when some of the first missionaries were being called and sent from New York State, the Lord told them to go and teach the gospel and cause my church to be established among them. Establishing the church is a vital direction in the work to which you've been called. You are not just called to proclaim the gospel. You are called to establish the church. As President Hinckley often taught, we should all seek to grow the ward. That is part of your missionary activities. Think of that as you seek to find persons to add to your teaching pool. Teach the gospel to investigators and retain them in activity after their baptisms. Reactivation is also an important part of establishing the church. So are the assignments you may receive to labor in individual wards or branches. But never lose sight of your paramount responsibility, which is to teach repentance and baptize converts. In this great effort, don't fail to teach the basic principles outlined in chapter 3 of Preach My Gospel. And don't fail to teach from the Book of Mormon. As stated in chapter 5 of Preach My Gospel about the role of the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon is powerful evidence of the divinity of Christ. It is also proof of the restoration through the prophet Joseph Smith. An essential part of conversion is receiving a witness from the Holy Ghost that the Book of Mormon is true. It teaches the doctrine of Christ plainly, especially in the lessons you teach investigators. Use it as your main source for teaching the restored gospel." End of quote. When you connect your investigators to the Book of Mormon, you will give them a secure resource to go to grow and go forward with their families to qualify for all the blessings of the restored gospel. The conversion we seek is not just an event that precedes baptism, but a process that follows baptism and continues throughout our lives. You should therefore teach your investigators to study so they can be nourished by the good word of God. Teach them to pray so they can be inspired by the Holy Ghost. Teach them to pay their tithing so they can enjoy the blessings promised for obedience to that important principle of the gospel. Teach them to attend church each Sabbath so they can partake of the sacrament and be renewed in the cleansing effect of their baptism and enjoy the fulfillment of the Savior's promise that the Spirit of the Lord will always be with them. My dear fellow missionaries, we salute you and love you as choice servants of the Lord, spending this portion of your lives in his service. And you are in his service, carrying the fullness of the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. As his servant, I testify of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. I testify of the truth of the things taught in this worldwide broadcast. And as his servant, I invoke his blessings upon you in all of your efforts in his service. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
Our dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this wonderful opportunity that we have had to be taught and to be trained by the missionary department of the church. We are so grateful for our leaders and for the amazing things that we have learned today that will help us in this glorious work. We ask thee, Father, to please help us go forth and teach repentance, baptize converts. We are so grateful for our Savior. We are so grateful for his atonement. We pray, Father, that we will always have his name on our lips and be prepared to testify of him, that we may bring others to taste of the great joy that the gospel has brought to our lives. We pray, Father, that we will go forward in faith and that we will see miracles all around the world in this marvelous work. We love thee, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.